Welcome to the May edition of the ESAC Talks, our monthly youth-led conversations about cultural heritage. Today we'll be, we will be discussing community engagement. My name is Riley Marshall and I'm a member of the ESAC Coordination Committee, and I'm happy to see so many of you joining us here tonight. Um, this is just a reminder that this event is being recorded, so if you wish to remain anonymous, we ask you to please keep your camera turned off and please keep your microphones muted throughout the duration of the event unless you're a speaker or asking a question. The order of the events tonight will be first an address from our keynote speaker, and then the addresses from the four selected speakers based on the call for abstracts. At the conclusion of all the presentations, we will have time for a question and answer discussion. Um, and we invite all of you to think of questions as the speakers are presenting so that this can be a fruitful discussion. You're welcome to leave these questions in the chat or raise your hand and ask them aloud during the conversation following the, the presentations. Um, and this is a reminder that each speaker will leave us with a thought provoking question related to the theme of the month. And so we invite you to think about those questions and watch our social media accounts where there will be options to engage and participate. So without further delay, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker of the night. Juan Carlos Barrientos is the coordinator of um, the project coordinator at European Heritage Volunteers. Juan Carlos first became a lawyer specialized in business and international law, and then chose to pursue a master's in world heritage studies at BTU. He has worked as a legal intern for the IUCN Environmental Law Center. And apart from all this, he has a long history of volunteering. Juan Carlos, we are honored to have you here with us this evening and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, well, you all heard I come from a very small country in Central America called Honduras. And um, I will be sharing right now my screen so you can all see the presentation I prepared. There we go. So as I was telling you, I come from this small country in Honduras, in Central America. And um, I decided to, come to Europe and study World Heritage Studies in Germany. I have always been fascinated by history and discovering new cultures, which is why uh, I decided to come here. And I uh, started studying in B2s uh, a couple of years ago. And now I find myself here talking to all of you about my experiences. So I took my notes uh, because otherwise I get very excited when I'm talking about European Heritage Volunteers. So I might go off topic. So I decided to write everything down. So you might excuse myself if, if you see me reading at some point. And um, well, while I was uh, studying uh, in BTU in my first year, that's where I discovered uh, as a student, uh, European Heritage Volunteers. This uh, organization was offering incredible and unique opportunities to explore my new field of studies in a way textbooks and lectures couldn't. European Heritage Volunteers presented me with an opportunity to sample different kinds of uh, practical experiences in all the disciplines of heritage and uh, a chance to take part in real hands-on work at actual heritage sites. So for me as a student seeking to find my professional path through the heritage field, of course, I sign up for this adventure. So I'll be telling you about this, how I came to European Heritage Volunteers before I start talking about the program itself. So as I began in this summer of adventures with this new organization I had discovered as a World Heritage student, I joined several projects. This was in 2018. So these projects soon took me to far away, fantastic locations I never imagined working at especially coming from a small Caribbean country. So to find myself suddenly in a medieval castle by the Rhine or learning about magnificent Baroque gardens or then finding myself restoring a traditional stone wall at a vineyard uh, but taught by local craftsmen. This was an amazing experience. And then uh, we were even guests of honor uh, at the community festival and we were even, I can show you the next slide, we were even featured at a local newspaper. So it was really, um, really a wonderful discovery that I found European Heritage Volunteers that first summer of my studies as a World Heritage student. 
So I met a lot of uh, incredible people, young professionals, which were also engaging in this activism with me. And, and indeed it was uh, opening a new world for me. So during that summer of education and adventure, I got to learn a lot of new skills. I got to learn about how traditional techniques of conservation are done in several sites. I was uh, learning from craftsmen, learning from local people. I was uh, restoring a 300 year old door in a, in, a work, in a training course. I also had the opportunity to um, show the cultural heritage of my own country in public presentations to local communities doing these projects. So it was overall amazing. And um, my adventures that summer with European Heritage Volunteers took me then to an enchanting hilltop and by the Adriatic Sea in Albania, to a small rundown Byzantine church of the seventh century. And if you know me, you know I love to tell this story because it was really uh, one of the most special experiences I had in my life. There, um, we worked for two weeks alongside a team of young heritage professionals from 12 different countries. We were guided by expert craftsmen and local heritage conservation experts. And we all came together to work in the rescue and reconstruction of a historical roof in a church. The project was organized by European Heritage Volunteers alongside a constellation of local partners, mm -hmm. including local activists, regional heritage authorities, and the national authorities. Soon, uh, the whole town knew we were working there in the church. And many people came to see us at a working site, and they were happy to have a group of young international heritage professionals helping save their, their special church. So we became the talk of the town and the local community uh, our activists, they were delighted that we were bringing a focus from the outside world into their small town. And uh, also to have these people from such diverse backgrounds and places all gathered in the same place doing this amazing work guided by these amazing instructors. It was really great. So the local hosts, they brought us on guided tours to visit sites of heritage importance in the region. And uh, well, the local people were so thrilled that uh, many times we were invited to have coffee and uh, rakie in, in the town. So it was really nice. But the best part of this experience for me was on the last day of our hard work. We cleaned up the interior of the church after restoring the roof and we placed back in the altar the cleaned up religious icons. So then the group, we just sat down inside of the church and tried to admire the work we had done for two weeks. And um, suddenly a small, small old lady came into the church and she uh, um, lit a candle in front of the icons. Then she turned to us and she blessed us. And she said in her language, we understood a prayer and she uh, blessed us and we could see in her eyes, she was so thankful for what we had done there. And wow, she left and we were left in silence and everyone had tears in their eyes at that moment. It was such a special moment. After that, uh, the whole town gathered. So the whole community was there. It was even press there. Everybody was there to inaugurate the new church. So they, um, they had a special ceremony for the inauguration and then we had some speeches and the people, the local representatives of the community spoke and then they all got together to ring the new bell. We had also recently just installed in the, in the bell tower, which hadn't rung like in five, 40 years. So it was amazing. It was uh, at that moment, in that moment that I realized that I had chosen the right career path. I saw how my work beyond the halls of the university, how my work could have a real impact on people, on local communities. This was all thanks to this project organized by the European Heritage Volunteers. And uh, indeed, this was uh, something I will always be thankful to the program for lending me this opportunity to discover my own path and to, for this amazing summer that really changed my life. 
After that, I went on joining more projects the next summers. And eventually now I'm honored really to be part of the staff of European Heritage Volunteers since early 2020. And um, after sharing to you how I got here, I'm really delighted to um, introduce you to the program. So European Heritage Volunteers is a non-governmental organization, a non-profit organization based in Germany. It's engaged in activities all over Europe, connecting a network of partners, linking heritage with volunteering. It's been active since 1990. And um, it has organized alongside our partners, more than 200 projects in 26 different European countries with more than 3000 participants representing over 70 different nationalities from all continents. So you can see there the dots representing the projects and training courses all over Europe that have happened or are happening. And from the far north in open museums in Finland in, in uh, this uh, heritage churches in North Russia to the Caucasus in the far east of the European cultural sphere to the shores of the Atlantic in Portugal. It, it's uh, a lot of presence, for example, in the Balkans. So there is um, a wide variety of sites, a wide varieties of European cultures, which are, uh, and are connected through this network of partners and activists and everybody who's part of this great initiative. Um, we are now organizing yearly between 30 and 40 projects and training courses in around 26 different countries dedicated to the rescue, documentation and conservation of Europe's tangible and intangible heritage. We're focusing on a variety of sites, as I mentioned before. It's uh, from well-known world heritage sites to lesser known heritage places with relevance for the local narratives. Uh, from castles to churches to places of Jewish heritage to cultural landscapes, archaeological sites, historical gardens. Uh, there's a mixture of, of, of locations from rural heritage sites to uh, urban heritage sites and city centers, important world museums, uh, industrial heritage sites like mines and uh, so many more so many more places where we are, we have a, a presence in these projects and training courses. The main target group are students of heritage related fields and young heritage professionals, heritage enthusiasts, uh, people who are seeking hands on experiences and challenging academic experiences. Um, European Heritage Volunteers is a member of the expert group on cultural heritage of the European Commission. It collaborates with several universities and other educational institutions in numerous countries that are offering heritage related studies. It actively collaborates with many heritage related institutions, organizations and initiatives on international, national, regional and local levels in more than 30 European countries. So this is, as I mentioned before, a constellation of people coming together in different initiatives all under one banner, one umbrella, uh, which is uh, amazing to see, to see this happening. This is the kind of grassroots initiatives that need support, that need to be visible so people can hear and learn how we are getting together to, to do this. Um, as I mentioned before, also there's uh, so many themes going on in the projects. So you can learn different topics as a volunteer when you're applying. You can learn from stone uh, techniques. You can learn uh, to how to conserve mosaics in an ancient Roman site. You can learn about plasters. You can learn about wood traditional techniques. You can work restoring, uh, learning how to restore tradition, this uh, uh, historical windows, working in archeological digs, um, or being on top of a roof in a church in front of the Adriatic Sea restoring uh, wood and roof. So it's a, a, a plurality of experiences you can have. There's also a lot of focus in research and heritage in some projects, uh, storytelling of heritage and uh, documentation of heritage where, where the organization goes to places where the, this uh, kind of interventions are needed 
or where sites are needing some kind of um, outside focus so, so that um, the work being done by the local associations can become relevant to a pan-European level through the eyes of these heritage professionals coming in. So we bring the light from the outside and the focus to these places. And uh, this helps also raise awareness among the local communities to, uh, about their own heritage. As I mentioned, in, in this church in Albania, the townspeople were very uh, excited to see how their heritage was relevant to people coming from Honduras or Mexico or Germany. So this is the kind of things that help bring together this constellation of local people, this, the, the local activists, the townspeople, the regional heritage authorities, and all together, maybe they don't cooperate uh, in the regular basis, but when they have these projects in their place, they all come together to one focus, which is to make the, the project happen. Then they all can find themselves working together, hand in hand, different aspects of the community, united by the projects and training courses, which is amazing. So as I mentioned, uh, this is one of our focus. This is this awareness raising for European cultural heritage. Uh, the aim is to promote the conservation and work done by local activists, associations and institutions. Uh, for this, we also, aside from the projects and training courses, we also organize activities uh, such as conferences, exhibitions, workshops, seminars and information sessions. This is always done with the help of our uh, partners uh, everywhere, everywhere in Europe who come together with us and make these experiences happen. Um, the European Heritage Volunteers brings communities and local actors together with young heritage professionals through volunteering activities, creating a platform to unite them under a single objective, which is the conservation of heritage. We have uh, another important tool uh, for raising awareness is the European Heritage Times. It's an online and biannual printed publication which brings together heritage reporters based around Europe to write about their local heritage related topics and articles which are published uh, on the platform of the European Heritage Times and also shared on social media channels. So this is, um, as I mentioned also already, we have uh, this kind of, of, of initiatives that uh, focus on um, heritage storytelling because through our projects and, and training courses and through this kind of uh, initiatives of European Heritage Times, uh, European Heritage Volunteers helps also tell the stories of the local communities, tells the stories behind closed doors of what happens on these heritage sites. And um, this is what gives us uh, so much um, the will to continue to do this amazing work. So I think I was, um, I hope, I think I did not extend myself much. And I hope you could have a complete image about what European Heritage Volunteers is doing. And um, also the kind of network we are building together. And uh, we wish to invite you to, if you are a young heritage professional, to apply and join to our projects, be part of our team. If you, are, uh, if you want your university linked to us, please message us and we want to continue to open more doors to bring more people into this initiative and these activities. Um, and if you wanna follow us over the summer, because this summer we have amazing projects and training courses going on all over Europe which I didn't go into detail today, but um, you, could, you can find out more about by visiting our homepage and following us on our social media. We are active on Instagram, on Facebook, uh, recently on YouTube channel, which we are now showing, showcasing several videos there uh, about the projects and different projects we have been working on the past years. And uh, we recently also can be found in LinkedIn. So you can also follow us there. And overall, I hope that um, my short presentation was able to inspire uh, people who had not heard about us uh, to join and to be part of this movement because this is something that is built by young heritage professionals taking part. This is a uh, movement that we are creating together 
to bring um, all these different activists and enthusiastic heritage professionals, in, instructors, uh, everybody who was involved in a way in, in, in their own local way in heritage can be united by uh, our uh, program in this umbrella of, in this, of this network and continue working to raise awareness about cultural heritage for future generations. I am sure details about how to participate and how to and uh, the, how much you have to pay as a fee or for example all these details you can find in our homepage or I can be happily answering to you if you write me an email. Um, so I hope this was um, okay a com complete presentation. So I'm uh, turning the floor back to uh, Riley. So we can continue with our conversation. All right, thank you very much, Juan Carlos. It's wonderful to hear about the work that you've been involved in and the initiatives of European heritage volunteers, especially because it's something that we as youth can be involved in. Um, so hopefully we are able to discuss a little bit further in the question and answer after the event. And to move on to our four speakers selected based on the call for abstracts. First tonight, we will have Mohammed. Mohammed graduated as an architect from Halloween University and is now starting his career in architectural conservation in his hometown of Cairo. As well, he is currently studying a master's of science at Halloween University and participates in several national and international architectural competitions and workshops. We're happy to have you here with us tonight, Mohammed. The floor is yours. Hi, all. Thank you. Hi from Caillou. <laughs> Let me share now. Okay. We are we, we are a group of nine student students from a uh, faculty of fine arts in Cairo. Our faculty is a multidisciplinary with five interconnected programs, architecture, interior design, graphic design, and sculpture. As we started two months ago, we held several online meetings through Zoom to create a framework for our future. Our, our project is Cario Heritage Alarm. Is an online platform to digitalize and document the unseen architectural heritage of our city, Cairo. Unfortunately, the situation of architectural heritage in Cairo is very concerning, especially in the last 20 years. We have lost a lot. For example, this image, can you see? Can you see it? As you see here, many, many historic districts were demolished to, to make space for more development, more road development, manipulated by the failing official govern, government and weak laws and mass urbanization. Hundreds of buildings with different typologies and architectural styles were demolished without even having any chance to be protected or at least be archived properly. Our, our question was, can digital archiving became an alternative? Our project aimed to digital digitally capture available data and archived it for future generations. In our first stage, 30 buildings within Daher district in central Cairo will be fully covered and digitally archived. Archives start with tracing and collecting existing historical records of the building, then full coverage of photography and vide videography of the whole building, then trying to uh, digitally reconstruct it with sample software tools maybe SketchUp and 3D Smacks. This database will be the start of a digital atlas to be used by a variety of tar target audience. 
and target users, different users with uh, to, to be more inclusive with different ages and different uh, different uh, styles, different um, different jobs. Maybe um, as a, hang on, maybe not students of architecture. All the users, all the, the the residents of the city can participate. We are currently trying to create a template similar to the e-commerce heritage alert template. Even trying um, you inhabited uh, five several years ago to create a similar survey. And our future plans include local exhibitions and monthly magazine for our work and an annual book. Our question is, can community be the catalyst for change? Can community really protect their heritage using sample digital tools? And thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed, for your presentation. Um, our next speaker will be Sherry Bone. Sherry is from Australia. Because of her master's degree, she has ended up between Germany and Egypt, studying conservation and management of heritage sites. She is currently involved in writing her thesis and working as an intern for ESAC, Europa Nostra, and European Heritage Volunteers. She is passionate about working with people and making any small difference she can on the local level. The floor is yours, Sherry. Thank you very much. I'm hoping I can figure out this brand new um, technique that I've just been taught about sharing the screen. So let's give it a go. I'll just ask you to confirm that you can indeed see my screen. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so not cutting to any more of my time. Um, so yeah, my thesis research is titled Beyond Engagement, Community-Led World Heritage Nominations of Indigenous Sites in Australia. So why do I say beyond engagement? Well, while engaging with communities, and in my case, Indigenous communities, has really long been acknowledged as integral within the heritage field, there's been a growing movement towards trying to go beyond this. What's next? Heritage has often adapted Einstein, I'm sorry, Einstein's 1969 Ladder of Citizen Participation and uses this to talk about how we can engage with communities. And as this image based on a report about engagement with Indigenous Australians illustrates, there's a wide spectrum from more passive to more active engagement that can be undertaken. So engaging communities is just one step in this process. I believe that the goal should be the handing over of leadership when possible through the empowerment and capacity building. When a site is inscribed by others and against the wishes of the people who live in that place, there are a number of negative outcomes which can and have previously occurred. So in my research, I really advocate for Indigenous people taking the lead in nominating the heritage sites for inscription upon the World Heritage List. Kind of assessing really the impacts that this can have both for the Indigenous people and for the global community. So as you can see here in my research, I look at the wider context. Of course, I look at the global uh, scale of UNESCO and Indigenous people and human rights. And then I focus primarily on Australia, being where I'm from, and its relationship with Indigenous people and world heritage and the progress that has happened through time with this. So my two case studies represent a successful and an ongoing process. And this is in that Budjbem was successfully inscribed in 2019, and Marujuga is in the process of writing its nomination dossier. Unfortunately, I can't go into detail about these um, two fantastic sites. But I do assure you that they're equally wonderful places full of immense tangible and intangible cultural heritage. And if you do ever get the chance, I, I really highly recommend both places and Australia in general, of course. Um, I also put here that my definition of communities I use um, because the community rhetoric is completely rampant in world heritage and there's very little consensus as to what the term actually implies. So it's very necessary to define what you mean by community. So my two communities I use here are the Nuranali 
and the Gunditch Mara. Um, they're people, they're communities of place, of interest and of practice. Uh, they live within and around the places of this vast living heritage and these cultural landscapes. So the main outcomes of my research thus far is that I really highlight the, out, um, the what kind of comes out of the indigenous led World Heritage nominations and I advocate for its need. But my research also really recognizes that the World Heritage system is in, in itself a Western construct and it's limiting. There's outstanding universal value, there's the 10 criteria, there's the division of nature and culture, the technicality of the process. And as such, this doesn't always align with indigenous worldviews. I frame all of this within the structure versus agency debate. Society is really made up of many structures that limit us in ways, the institutions, the laws, um, the world heritage system is one. People, however, they have the agency to make choices within these structures. And through time, they can ultimately alter them. So Indigenous-led World Heritage nominations have the opportunity to, and they have changed the system over time. Hence these benefits that I speak of. So for the structures, Indigenous-led World Heritage nominations, they support sustainability at all levels. For example, promoting traditional knowledge like cultural burnings, which are very common in Australia. They challenge the authorised heritage discourses or the, the common ways of speaking about heritage in a place. So at Bujbin, uh, the Gunditjmara were not simply hunter-gatherers. They were creators of a vast aquaculture system, which enabled the, them to actually become sedentary for periods of time. Previously, this was not known. And finally, they challenged the power structures that I previously mentioned, for example, the World Heritage System. And then for the agents, agents and, and by agents, the people, which is the most important aspect. So there is the gaining of societal respect through recognition of indigenous rights, including the basic human rights that all people should have and the right to land and to self-determination. Through leadership, legit legitimacy may be given to traditional knowledge and belief systems, giving them equal standing to the Western versions on such a global platform like the World Heritage List. Leadership leads to different partnerships where there is capacity built and equal input given in decision-making about control of lands, for example. It's really a way to change the narrative. There are other often cited benefits, including poverty alleviation, intergenerational integration, employment opportunities, and strengthened cultural identity. But a point I found particularly significant and would like to end on is that internally at both sides, the process towards World Heritage nomination resulted in cultural in social cohesion among really diverse people. Indigenous Australians are not a holistic group of people, of course, most of you probably know. For example, Murujuga, there are five language groups which have right to this land and they all have different stories to tell. But through World Heritage listing and nomination, they've come together under a shared goal and a shared drive to achieve something amazing. And this is really significant to me. So uh, I turn it over to you um, to talk about in the Q&A. My research really made me think a lot about my positionality as a non-Indigenous person. And who am I to speak about this topic? And it's, it is still an ongoing struggle that I have. It was for this reason that I tried to go for a more, for a less localized focus, um, even though I have actually worked um, in one of these sites myself. Um, but instead I decided to look at what I see as more of an institutional issue. So with that, I ask you when, if ever, is it okay to speak on behalf of or for communities? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherry, for sharing your research with us um, and such an important point of view as well. Our next speaker tonight will be Tiago. He is a master's student in history and heritage at the University of Algarve and is dedicated to the study of issues related to the Faro Convention and the value of cultural heritage in contemporary society. Under the title of Connecting Heritage and Youth Through Minecraft, um, he will show us a community-led project based on new technologies. Welcome, Tiago. The floor is yours. Thanks, Riley. So I'm going to share with you. So uh, 
first of all, thank you for having me uh, uh, today. As Riley said, I will share with you my experience as the project manager for My Momo Faro and the way we are managing to engage community um, in, with the heritage of the modern movement in Faro, which is a small town uh, in Portugal. Um, so the My Momo Faro um, project, uh, as the name says, is Minecraft and Modernist Architecture uh, of Faro. It is a pilot project that emerged within the scope of the Faro's candidacy for the European Capital of Culture 2027. Um, so it, it's a project that it's in, it is in line with the Faro Convention uh, and is also a way uh, of responding to a classifying process um, of a urban uh, complex in Faro as a municip municipal interest. Um, so uh, this project is an heritage education project that explores um, the 20, uh, 21, 21st century skills through project-based learning and game-based game learning approaches in order to bring heritage into the school curricula, uh, promote the involvement in this process, uh, enhance the heritage education through the digital skills and promote the understanding of the uh, 20th century architecture as real cultural heritage. So uh, the, part, the participants of this project uh, are then challenged to explore the architecture of the modern movement in the, munici in the municipality with the Minecraft Education Edition as a tool to reproduce and explore the various buildings that we selected. It is mainly addressed to the school community um, with, uh, it, from 12 to, um, to 16 years old uh, of the six basic schools of the municipality having an interdisciplinary uh, basis with teachers from different areas such as science, arts, chemistry, ICT, languages such as Portuguese, French, English, and among other, other ones, promoting uh, this articulation with the school curricula. So um, what is happening is that teachers are giving the expected subjects through the game and uh, the exploration of this theme of the modern movement architecture. The process uh, to involve the school community in this project started by um, giving teachers uh, training and qualification in the use of Minecraft applied to education and specific, specifically uh, to heritage. Um, then we uh, select, selected the buildings based on the original projects to which we had access and according to the urban axis classification criteria. Um, we also um, give uh, thematic classes with the kids involved with a contextualization of modern architecture and the spotlight of the importance of creativity in the school context and the importance of how we look to our city and our heritage. Uh, we also um, did some guided tours to the classified urban axis with the architects and the technicians responsible uh, for that classification process in order to allow the involvement with the city itself, awakening some new, perspective, new perspectives about the buildings and the, the, the architects. Um, we also um, were having uh, some discussion panels involving experts and the civil, civil community as, as well. Uh, with themes such as Faro as uh, a city that stands out as uh, modernist in the Southern Europe, uh, how uh, people live um, in these houses, and next week, uh, one about the importance of new educational approaches and to um, the heritage education in the context of digital transition. So uh, the results we, we are now uh, getting, uh, this is a project that uh, it's, it's still happening. Uh, so in order to bring uh, heritage to schools and make it more democratic and participa participatory, 
Uh, these are some preliminary results we have achieved. Uh, we um, involve more than uh, 120 students, 16 teachers and five partners with emphasis on the National Plan of Arts and the Microsoft Education team. Uh, we also um, develop more sense of belonging. We are notice, noticing in the kids and the teachers uh, that sense of belonging and more knowledge about the topic and the city itself. Uh, a foster a growing valorization and a new look at this architecture as cultural heritage. Uh, we are also aroused enthusiasm in the rest of the school community, which is not participating this time and has expressed their desire uh, to do so in the coming years. Um, and we also uh, strengthen relationships and create a sense of community between teachers and students from different schools, between the different partners and between uh, the, the municipality and uh, that schools um, that are all connected by heritage. So in this way, uh, our next steps are uh, make a real assessment of the impact of the project by analyzing the data collected through the process um, and give continuity with at least two editions and expansion it at regional and uh, international level through some different and um, to some different ways and new partners that are very interested. So the the question I leave uh, I, and I make is, do you think game-based learning can really change heritage education uh, mindset? Thank you. Thank you, Tiago. Um, what interesting work. Certainly not a perspective I've considered before, but, but very, um, very interesting to learn about. Um, and so we will move on tonight to our final speaker, uh, Serena. Serena, um, as a cultural manager working in the cultural heritage and NGO fields, she has acquired skills in museum education, event management, and youth and volunteer engagement. Today, she will share her work with her involvement with European heritage volunteers. Thank you for joining us, Serena. The floor is yours. Thank you, Riley, for the nice introduction. Happy to see you all here. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, start sharing my screen. Um, just a second. <clears throat> Is it okay right now? So I'd like to share a bit of my experience on community engagement uh, and volunteering for heritage. I think we can also call this how to organize a heritage project involving the community. So in my opinion, we are always part of a community of some sort, but we are here to discuss how broad and strong can community building and engagement be around heritage. Uh, it is my personal belief that community building is based on enthusiastic leadership and storytelling. And here's why. So I joined a European Heritage Volunteers Partner Project in Finland in 2019. It was a very inspirational project and motivated me to try uh, planning a project in Romania, my home, home country. Uh, so this photo you can see right now dates back to 2019. We were in the final stages of our work. And in the background, uh, you can see some members of the local community gathered to uh, acknowledge our work and uh, congratulate us. Uh, so during that time, the two weeks spent in Finland, I learned the word talco, which uh, actually best describes this um, type of project. So back home, uh, together with the association I work for, uh, we began a planning. Um, it's actually easier when you are motivated uh, of course, we sent letters of intent before finding the right and enthusiastic uh, part of the museum. And uh, after identifying the main aim of the project, which you'll see soon, uh, it was conservation and restoration for sheepskin coats. We focused on schedules, uh, locally sourcing goods and services, um, planning trips and educational activities, 
while consulting with the local community. Um, so we thought how to strengthen the community around the project. So the enthusiasm of both Romanian partners was key in organizing the project. And we already uh, had the help of the European Heritage Volunteers community. Um, also along the way, it helped us uh, share stories, uh, facilitate works, motivate and inspire, and of course, some other things you see here. So in 2020 in Romania, this was our uh, working site. This is uh, the local museum in Bistrița. Uh, it's a courtyard. <laughs> and uh, as I said before, we focused on sheepskin coats. Um, eight volunteers from seven countries participated. Uh, the group managed to work on over 20 pieces during the project, during the two weeks. Um, we thought sheepskin, sheepskin coats uh, were the perfect illustration for the community's diversity because this type of costumes uh, best build a bridge between the past and uh, the future, allowing also intangible and tangible heritage meet. So this is how um, sheepskin coats in Romania look. Um, we ended the project with exhibiting the sheepskin coats we worked on for the past two weeks. Members of the staff gathered to see the results. Uh, I would also like to add that uh, the local community received the participants very well and made sure they felt part of a bigger family. They were, uh, they were also curious to find out more about their cultures. Um, at the end, uh, we all realized that the initial benefits and objectives we've set were surpassed. Apart from the actual conservation and restoration work and educational opportunities, the group of participants itself uh, became a community with friendship and professional links that can expand over uh, into other community-led projects. And as an outcome for 2021, we are preparing another project focusing on sheepskin coats um, and this time we'll organize this in the same framework but in Sibiu at Astra National Museum Complex. This is how it looks. <laughs> uh, it is considered the largest open-air museum in Romania and the second largest in Europe actually because it covers an impressive 96 hectares of land and the exhibitions covers uh, 42 hectares. The museum organizes a series of events to promote the folk traditions in Romania. They keep the community engaged at all times. It is part of their credo. And I'd be happy to um, hear other ways uh, you think can connect community to its heritage. And thank you. Thank you, Serena, and thank you again to all of our speakers for sharing your wonderful projects and work with us here tonight. In just a few moments, we'll have time for our question and answer session. So we invite you, those of you that have questions for our speakers to type it in the chat if you would like, or if you're comfortable raising your hand um, to ask aloud, we would certainly invite that participation as well. And before moving on to our question and answer session, I have just a few ESAC announcements that I would like to share with all of you. First of all, um, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And for those of you that have been following along the ESAC talks this year, we have been um, really honored to have your participation. And we will be going on a short pause for the summer, but we'll be resuming the ESAC talks in September. So um, stay in touch with us, follow social media, and um, we will share more details as we have them with you there. Um, I'd also like to point out that we have a new job board on the ESAC website where you can find jobs related to cultural heritage, jobs and jobs postings. Um, so it's a great resource to check it out if you have not done so already. And one particular opportunity um, I would like to highlight is the ESAC internship. Um, so please stay in touch with us over the summer. Keep, um, keep involved with our social media. And, and with that, I will open the floor up for questions.
Okay, I think I can. I'm not sure if you saw me, but <laughs> go ahead. Uh, um, yeah. So my questions for Tiago. I was wondering, um, what made you choose specifically Minecraft? So was there? Um, I don't. Know, I don't know if uh, there were. You t thought about other options, or I mean, it's a fantastic engagement idea. Um, I personally saw how Animal Crossing was also very popular in the museum field when they uploaded their collections and so on. So why specifically Minecraft? Um, what makes it different from other gaming platforms? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Minecraft wa was choose um, because in, in our team, um, there are some people that are uh, experts in using Minecraft as a tool uh, with uh, heritage. So um, we, we want to, to make uh, the kids uh, the architects of, the, of that project. And Minecraft um, is also uh, an, awesome, uh, an awesome tool because uh, you can not only uh, construct the, the, the structure, but you can study uh, all the materials, uh, make the materials for your uh, buildings, uh, and you can make it at scale. Um, so uh, was was that the reason that we 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 choose the the Minecraft? Cool, thanks. So it's it's a tool that we should be more aware of. <laughs> Not just the game. Nice, thanks. I have a question for Juan Carlos. Um, I know you shared the story about um, in the church when, when one of the residents came up and, and interacted with your group. I'm curious on the organizational end with European Heritage Volunteers, if there's a lot of work that goes into kind of, um, I guess, building a bridge between the community and the volunteers that come, um, how that works or if that's something that tends to happen more naturally. Well, it goes both ways. It happens naturally when people realize that we are there. Uh, people come to ask what we're doing and passersby start realizing. And usually we work, uh, most of the projects are located in rural areas. So there's easy way of word going around the town. And uh, really this is something that uh, excites uh, people to see foreigners coming to their place and people who are from the heritage field and young professionals taking notice of their heritage. And, and for them, it's a sense of pride, I think, from their local heritage. And they come along and they start trying to, 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 to interact with us. But also we, uh, well, the local hosts or partners in the sites, they usually organize uh, encounters with the community through, first of all, we, uh, since part of the objectives of having these projects in the sites is to raise awareness and place a focus on the sites. Um, the uh, local partners try to reach out to local uh, press and organize press visits so the word can get out of what we're doing there and word, word gets out about the site itself. So in the end, it's a very beneficial thing for, for the local activists working for this conservation and, and awareness raising so of these uh, heritage sites. And also uh, in regular years, we organize on each project, there's always a presentation to the public where uh, we invite people from the local community to come together in a site, in a place. And uh, the volunteers, the participants, they present um, heritage sites and heritage topics from their own countries to the local community relating to, their, to the local site. So this is another way of having this exchange between the local community and uh, participants. And usually it's been very successful events uh, where we have a lot of uh, people uh, discovering the world, seeing the world through our participants in these presentations. And uh, unfortunately, last year, this was a very limited because of uh, COVID. It was not uh, possible. We're still not sure if this year is going to be possible, to what extent we can do this. But this is a regular part of the, of the program on each project and training course. Um, Veronica, go ahead. Okay, hey. uh, well, actually I have two questions, one for Juan Carlos and one for Sherry. Um, first to Juan Carlos, based on your um, experience as a participant and now on the coordination side, do you see 
as a, an opportunity to implement such a system in the region as such as uh, Latin America, which in theory could be even easier since we share a common language in most of the countries. But of course, there are other challenges uh, to face. Would you imagine being able to, to implement a system like that in, in that region? Well, we are not, uh, first of all, I think uh, limitations uh, on Latin America as we are both Latin Americans. We know that there is uh, enormous challenges in logistics to, to, to implement something of the quality and the standards of what we do in European Heritage Volunteers, but each region has their own uh, uh, initiatives. And also there is the World Heritage Volunteers Initiative that coordinates these activities in, around the, uh, in, in other latitudes. And um, of course, uh, I think that the, the difference would be that uh, here in Europe, we have um, a big possibility of accessing a network of people. And also even uh, logistically, it's easier here in Europe because there's more willingness in the local communities to invest in, 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 in these projects. Uh, there's more capacity of local partners to uh, invest uh, in, in developing these activities, which may be more limited in Latin America to speaking about the region we both come from and we know very well. So um, yes, in definitely uh, it, it, it can be done to some extent, it, it's uh, sporadically done in, in Latin America, but as an organized, in an organized level of an, a, a community, a network, as we have in Europe with European Heritage Volunteers, like for example, Sorina is an example of this, that uh, this is easily more done here, uh, I think, personal opinion. Um, if, if I can just quickly jump in on that. We had a speaker before in one of our talk, in one of the ESAC talks that um, she was part of the organizers of the Belize Heritage um, education community group and then I, I can post the link here and they also it's it was not exactly volunteering groups but they also have different um like heritage programs or also short projects that they they organize in belize and they the communities are doing it as well the structure might be a little bit different but i think it's also a nice example of the things that can be done and and how And I see Pravali, you have your hand up. Yes, Riley, thank you. Uh, Juan, thank you for that presentation. Um, it, just to also respond and add to what he was saying and to respond to Veronica's question, we have the uh, World Heritage Volunteers Initiative at UNESCO. And in fact, we collaborated with European Heritage Volunteers for many years um, and they were coordinating our European bit, but uh, we have, volunteering activities in all the regions of the world. I'm gonna try and share the link here perhaps. So you do have um, a lot of activities that happen in Latin America already. Um, those are you know, projects that you might want to look at. And also because it's a more global sort of perspective, you, you can always also look at uh, volunteering exchange across continents um, where you, you benefit from the expertise of the local interest groups as Juan rightly mentioned, but you also have the diversity of, uh, you know, different regions. I've just shared the link here. And I think the, this year's calls are currently ongoing. Yeah, yeah, I'm, Thank I'm you. well aware of the, of the World Heritage uh, Volunteers, but uh, I think the, the scale compared to how much is done by European Heritage Volunteers is just um, minimum. Uh, so something like, uh, I will, Imagine how the, the benefits will be for implementing such a system, such dedicated as the European Heritage uh, Volunteers Project there that um, expands beyond the, the World Heritage Volunteers Program. Thank you for your recommendation. Um, and for Sherry, um, if no one else has a, a question, um, you mentioned the issues and the technicalities uh, of the World Heritage System. And actually that's something that um, I find as a, an obstacle for um, community, community led um, uh, uh, World Heritage nomination 
because at the end of the of the day, the warhage system is a is is dedicated for the for the governments. So how do you overcome those those obstacles for community led or being the, the government who's pitching the, <laughs> the nomination? Yeah, and I think it, it's case by case, of course, and it depends on the state party. Um, fortunately, Australia is is moving forward in this, and the way um, it has been done at, at my sites is that it's a um, it's been an election commitment. For example, that it's um, when um, state premiers are being elected, they're saying, "Okay, we will help you put forth this nomination, and we will help you um, lead this role." And they say, "We want you to." to have the leadership in this. It's always, um, as I talk about the whole structure and agency thing, there's always some kind of barriers that you have to work within the state, that the Indigenous people have had to work within. And when they're writing these nominations, it's very much a collaborative process. But where between, you know, experts, let's say experts, because this is required for the technical necessities of the nominations but the final say of what goes into the dossier and the final approval for it to be then sent to the government to be sent to the World Heritage Centre is by the Indigenous community that that is the representative of the Indigenous community so that's where I'm saying the leadership um, and I, I do in my research kind of define what do I mean by leadership as well because it comes in many forms. But based on the system, it has to be a collaborative process. There's some facilitation that has to happen. And this comes from the technicality of the process that doesn't always um, respect or allow indigenous worldviews. But there are examples in which, for example, the Pumachu and Aki uh, nomination or inscription from Canada a couple of years ago, it really changed the discourse around um, the comparative analysis, for example, because they said, we don't want to say that our site is better than all these other sites around the world. And they didn't in the end, and they kind of refused um, and reframed it in a different way. And it was nominated in the end. So this is what I mean about the system can slowly be changed and hopefully, you know, capacity can be built to make it more accessible for Indigenous people to lead these processes. It's, yeah, a step in the right direction, but definitely not there yet. So watch this space, I would say. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have any other questions in the audience? All right, I don't see any other hands raised. So I would like to thank um, all of our speakers again for sharing um, your thoughts with us here tonight. And for all of you that joined us, um, this was a nice conversation afterwards as well. Before we log off, we would like to take a quick photo for social media while we are all smiling and looking at the camera. So um, before signing off, if you don't mind sticking around for a quick photo um, and we will see you in September. Thank you. <laughs>